All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on preparing smart and safe communities for the unknown. NAPSEC Foundation's virtual training from May 31st, 2017. My name is Ryan Lankloss. I'm the director for state and local at the NAPSEC Foundation. We've got a great series of speakers today for us talking about their experiences in developing communities of practice around preparing, uh, supporting, and delivering operational support for, for staff and members using geospatial technologies. I'm joined today with David Allen, who's the GIS manager for the city of Euless, Texas, as well as the estate director of operations for the Texas Emergency GIS response team. Uh, David's going to be talking about the formation of the Texas EGRT process, how, how they've delivered that solution to the community there, how they've developed the cadre of folks that get deployed and support emergency operations across the state of Texas and some of the challenges that they've dealt with in getting to where they are today. And we also have Richard Buckwright, who's a CIO with the Florida Division of Emergency Management, and Scott Warner, who's the GS Specialist with Bay County Florida Emergency Services, both talking about how the state of Florida is following the similar model in developing the Florida Emergency GIS Response Team, how they've started to look at position qualifications, credentialing of individuals into a process of developing the, the Florida EGR team and kind of where they're headed today and where they're headed in the future in that process. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Objectives for today, we're going to talk again about the success of both of those states in building these organizations, uh, specifically the capabilities that they bear, uh, how they've developed those individuals, and the standardized resource typing and mission-ready package templates that you can utilize to do something very similar both at the local level or the state level where you work today. Uh, we're going to end the, the virtual training by giving you access to a series of tools to do a couple things. One is to download and use those position qualification sheets to customize them, make them your own, um, as well as some tools that can help you start to look at where you have deficiencies in geospatial maturity, not just in the solutions you provide, but in the overall maturity of SOPs, meaning standard operating procedures, common guidelines, and tools that really give you a, a full 360 view of how GS uh, is maturing inside of your organization or agency. That will give you a good starting point for figuring out where to prioritize both investments internally in terms of uh, building together the teams that you need, the SOPs that need to be developed around that, and then progressing forward into support mechanisms like an emergency response GIS team as well. So when you leave today, you're going to have access to a series of tools to help you do uh, everything that you've heard about from our speakers today. So with that, quickly, I'm going to turn it directly to David Allen. David, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll share the screen with you. Uh, if you could take over from there, give us a little bit of the history on the Texas Eager team. Tell us about the process there. We look forward to hearing from you. So thanks for joining today. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. If you can remind me how to do that. I did share my screen, but it didn't share. You bet, David. So you just a second, I made to see passing over there to you on the side. Okay. There we go. Uh, Try one more time to the button. Perfect. Okay, so are you seeing my screen? Is, is everyone seeing the screen? I'd try to share. Share one more time, David, if you would. Oh, there we go. Got it. Perfect. Got that? you on the side. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, how we got our response team set up in Texas, who's involved with this, how we got it set up. Uh, there's my contact information. That will also be on the last slide. So uh, don't feel like you have to race and jot all that down. Uh, you'll, you'll have some time. So question number one that I get all the time, I go into these emergency management conferences, why do we need emergency response maps? And uh, I have this little list of questions here, and I always, I always tell them, point out which of these questions you haven't had, had somebody say in the EOC. And obviously the number one is where did that happen? That's the first question. When you say, hey, there's been an explosion, what's your first question? Really where? You need a map for that. Um, how much area did this affect? Who's next to that? What are the adjacencies? We start having response teams show up. Where can we stage them? Where can we place equipment? How are we going to attack this thing? Uh, tell them how to get there. How many houses or structures were damaged? What, what's our damage assessments? What population might be affected by this? How many shelters do we have to set up? The questions just go on and on and on about, uh, about why we need maps. And then on top of that, all the other information that goes with that. And that's what we really bring into that. Uh, obviously, I don't have to 
convince map people that we need maps. So the other question, well, why don't we just do that ourselves? Why do we have to have a specialized team come in? And I've had this several times, like a, a, a dog search team. And they'll come in and say, oh, well, you know, we're all trained uh, dog technicians. We all have a trained dog. And then one guy sits back in the truck and he becomes the map guy. Well, what you're doing is you're taking a valuable resource out of the field and you're putting them in the EOC uh, where he's not going to be as effective. Uh, so we really like to, to say, um, you know, bring the map guy in. We'll, we'll integrate with whatever other team you bring in. We know what those teams we want. We train with them. Uh, we provide mapping for them. And then we have way better stuff than they're going to use. And I like to make that comparison. It's the nine-piece Tinker Toy set that they're going to try to use versus the Deluxe Director set that, that we use. And uh, that's, that's the Deluxe set that you can build the carousel with and, and the motorized Ferris wheel. I mean, the good one. So, uh, you know, we've got tools. we got talent. Let us do what we do. So in Texas, the way we have this set up is um, many of our larger cities have their own GIS response team. For instance, City of Fort Worth has one. Denton County has one. Uh, City of Austin has one. Uh, there's other places working on them. And then um, Army Corps of Engineers has a response team. Um, we have some of our other state agencies, like our uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has one. The Texas A&M Forest Service has one. So there's other agencies in our state that have response teams. Now, we're set up mainly as the response team um, for the Texas D Division of Emergency Management, or TDEM. You'll hear me say TDEM a couple of times. They're the ones that they are kind of top of the pile. They're the ones that really oversee all of the emergency response that goes on. They run the state operations center, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so with Texas Egret, what we've done is set up training protocols so we can train all of our people, and then we have software and all of that. We have, uh, we're actually closing in on 300 members statewide. And then we have statewide map templates and data sets ready to go. So we'll basically show up, pan to the location, and we're able to start doing mapping. So it doesn't take us any time at all to, to really get going with stuff once we get on site. Um, and then the Texas Division of Emergency Management, or TDEM, um, they really rely on us as their eyes in the field or their boots on the ground at the actual event. Uh, they, they have a few GIS people that, uh, that work out of Austin, and they man all the, the mapping software and such in the State Operations Center, but they don't really deploy on site. They do have a deployment team that brings um, technology to the site. So they'll bring in all kinds of projectors and computers and plotters and all that kind of stuff that's set up for us to use, but they just don't have the personnel to send. So all of these response teams sort of integrate into uh, what is our mapping response. So Texas Egret, we're a deployable team. Um, that's, that's with a wide deployable, not deplorable. Someone caught me on that one day. So uh, what we do is anyone can call our number. That's, that's the toll-free number, 844-TEXEGRT. You call that number, let me know what's going on, and if you need mapping support sent in, we can do that. Now, we can do either uh, come in and support the operation of an existing GIS team or an existing GIS department, or we can come in as the primary GIS response and, and pretty much run that part of it. Uh, so for instance, in the city of Dallas, uh, when they had the Ebola response, their GIS guys were doing stuff, but they only had a couple of guys they could put on that task. They needed about 10 more. So we backfilled all those positions uh, with, with GIS technicians for six days, I think, 23 different people over six days. Now we started as a regional group just for our county back in 2006. This was a, a few years after the space shuttle uh, disaster. And it took us a few years to really uh, become known in the, in the emergency response world, to get things set up and get things ready to go, get data sets ready. We were actually only representing 14 cities. And then in 2014, um, one of the guys from TDEM showed up at my door and said, hey, we're, we're really interested in this mapping thing that you guys are doing. You think you could expand that out a bit? And I thought he meant, you know, just a couple of counties, and, and they actually meant statewide. So in um, 2014, we did a pilot study that lasted uh, eight months. 
which covered 42 counties in North Texas. And during that eight month, uh, we, we trained GIS responders all over this region. Um, we built trust with the emergency management coordinators. We kind of got hooked in with all the other agencies so they would know to call us and they understand what we do so that when we show up, they'll recognize us and say, oh, hey, you guys do that. Uh, since then, we have expanded out and are now training GIS people all over the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. And our idea is that um, we don't have to be in one location and then travel all the way across the state to handle something. We have people locally that can go in and handle it. And we try to get people that work for government agencies in addition to people that work uh, in the private sector. That way, if, like, for instance, around here, if something happens and it crosses three city boundaries, those GIS people are not going to be available to come help me because they're already working. But I can call these private sector folks, and they come in and backfill positions, uh, and, and so we don't run out. Also with that, they don't really have a lot of travel time. They can travel probably less than an hour to get to the location, uh, work their shift, and then head home. These are the areas that we currently cover. Um, down in the lower left, you'll see the, the uh, 120, 121 counties, 15.8 million people, regions one, six, and four. We have those areas pretty much covered. We're doing a, uh, a round of training now to get more people in Houston. I've got about 45 people in Houston. I really got to crack the number of 50 before I would say that we would we would be able to spawn, respond uh, efficiently in that region. Uh, and then I've got about 20 people in Region 3 uh, down in the south. We're working on that. And uh, at some point, we'll get up into Region 5 up in the Panhandle. Um, the issue there is it's large, vast open areas, and there aren't a lot of GIS people up there. So if we respond, it's probably going to be people driving two, three hours to, to get in there. That, that's another whole issue. So for our training, we like to run all of our people through uh, these FEMA courses, uh, and you'll see these first three are required, and the other three, uh, the other two, I'm sorry, are optional. But it basically gets you in on the whole idea of how does this emergency response stuff work. You learn the language. Um, so when you go into an EOC and they start spouting all their acronyms and things, you understand what's going on. We also have our own um, Texas Egret online course, and it's sort of patterned after the style of those FEMA courses where you go through and answer questions and such, and there's a little test at the end. And we, we like to have our people go through that just to kind of get the feel of how mapping integrates in. And then we do a one-person, I'm sorry, an in-person one-day training class. And the idea there is that we get everyone in, hands-on on the computers, we open up the templates, we fool around with the data, we pull in aerial photographs, and we run through different response scenarios, and everyone gets a chance to, uh, to try all this stuff out, do a little real-time work. Um, that way you don't show up in the EOC and you're you know, trying to figure out what's going on. Our training guide, um, we laid this out based on how we, we would respond to different situations. And there's several of them listed here. The training guide has a lot more in it. And what we try to do is the left-hand side has step-by-step -step instructions of what you'll be doing to accomplish this sort of mapping. And then the right-hand side will have either a little data collection area, the symbology that you're supposed to use, and what that looks like, and then a sample map there at the bottom. So when you're done, you kind of realize your map was, was supposed to look like this. And the first thing people notice is how simple those maps are. And, and I always say, a simple map goes a long way in an emergency. You've got guys coming in from all over the state, conceivably. They're going to descend on this area. What do they need to know? What area is involved? What, what streets do I use to get there? Show me the street name, show me the location. And after that, they're going to look at this map for five minutes and then go out in the field and do whatever they do. So it doesn't have to be super complex. That works in our favor. It's not the best, most cartographically perfect map you've ever seen, but it does 99% of what they want to do in, in, the, uh, in the ESC. So we have these, um, these different templates. We have a template for common operational picture and a template for incident action plan. And then you can pull in all of those other scenarios that we just saw on the last slide. So I can pull in a bomb response or pull in a, a flooding or a swift water rescue or a, a, a field search or whatever. I can just drop those in as a layer file and it drops in the, uh, the data uh, and the symbology. 
so I don't have to I don't have to worry about setting any of that. So if I show up, open this common operational picture, I pan it to the location, I drag in the Swiftwater Rescue, and I'm ready to go. So almost as quickly as I can say that, I can open ArcMap, drop that stuff in, and be ready to go. So it's real nice. We use these statewide data sets that came from the Texas Natural Resources Information System, or we call it TENRIS, T-N-R-I-S. Um, they're statewide data sets, which lets us pan anywhere. We have uh, the road center lines, the, the hydrology, the, the railroad tracks, the I don't know what all. Uh, it's a whole big pile of stuff, in addition to aerial photographs that the state has done. So we have full statewide coverage. We just bring that in, and we're ready for anywhere in the state. And then on these templates, I'm working with Esri to take these templates and put them into ArcGIS Pro. And these are going to be uh, these are going to be uploaded on the Esri website at some time after the uh, the Esri user conference. And I'll be doing a presentation there if anyone's going to the the user conference. It's Tuesday, June the 11th, 10:15 to 11:30, and I think I get about 20 minutes. It'll be very similar to the presentation I'm giving right now, except that it will include these uh, ArcGIS Pro uh, templates. So when we go on a deployment, we're basically going to carry with us the equipment that we need, the hardware, laptops, plotters, projectors, that sort of thing, pull in some trained personnel, fire up the arc map, and we have our data sets ready to go. So with that, uh, even without internet connections, we can set up and begin making maps. And you saw how simple the maps are. They don't have to, they don't have to hold, be a whole lot of stuff. They don't have to be super fancy. So real simple data sets, real fast work, and we can get some good mapping put out. These are some examples that we've done over the years. Um, these have just been in the last couple of years. <clears throat> it seems that uh, the last couple of years we've been, become the tornado response. Before that, we were the flood response. Before that, we were the hurricane response. Um, it's just these things come in waves, I guess. So these are several different tornadoes that we've worked. Uh, and you can see in the lower right was one where we actually used the in-the-field collector and did damage assessment, which, of course, puts the dots right on the map. That, that was really, really nice. Uh, and then upper right one, you can see how simple a map that is. But that was to send out the, the uh, state troopers to protect certain areas. And all they wanted to know was what streets were they supposed to patrol and how far up the street they were supposed to go. And they went out and drove those all night just to prevent looting. <clears throat> we have uh, mobile capabilities we've been building up. And this is uh, from the city of Louisville, which is up in the, the Dallas area. And they got this new trailer full of equipment uh, that they call their EOC in a box. Now, it does a whole lot more than just the mapping stuff, but it has a plotter and it has two laptops that are dedicated for our use. So anytime they deploy, we go straight in there, set up the laptops, plug in the plotter, and we're off and running. Uh, it already has all our data sets and everything already on it. We also have an agreement going with the Salvation Army. They have a, a communications truck that they pull out. And it's got a, uh, a giant microwave antenna on the back that gives us Internet access. You can see in that upper left picture they have it set up and, and propped up behind the, uh, the truck. In that center picture, it's folded away. Uh, and then they also have the pop-up tents and, and things, tables and such, uh, and an onboard plotter. So we can set up there, plug into their network, hit that satellite dish, and pretty much have Internet connectivity when we need it. And then uh, we just got a grant that we'll, we'll be able to uh, access that grant in the fall, <clears throat> and then we'll get us our own response trailer. Now, the idea here is it's not a trailer we work out of. It's just a trailer to haul the equipment. And it will include laptops, network drives, uh, a generator, projector slides, plotters, all of that. So we'll be able to set up wherever it is, put all this stuff up, turn the generator on, plug everything together, and we would have the entire mapping system going. That, that come out, comes out at about uh, $35,000 worth of stuff. Now, in the emergency response world, that's a drop in the bucket. And when I, when I did this application, I had to go in front of the review committee and say what we wanted. And they're all just sort of glancing around, you know. Is that all you want? Is that all you need? Is, it's only $35,000. we got several million dollars to spend, and all you want is $35,000. So uh, I kind of felt silly. I should ask for more, but maybe next year. So some of the responses that we've been on, uh, a lot of flooding events around here, a lot of those are um, 
they, they don't really do a lot of damage. It's just some high water that will close roads and things. And then they wind up maybe doing some swift water rescue. Somebody drives in the water and their car floats off, something like that. Um, but a lot of it is also monitoring the dams. So if a dam were to break, what would what would happen? And we'll map that out in advance of here's where we think the water is going to go. Here's the houses we think would be affected. So if we start seeing signs of this thing going, they know where to go do evacuations and such. We had a um, a big um, a gas tanker flip over and start leaking and catch fire. Uh, that turned into about a three-day event. That was a pretty cool one. We got to go down to Juarez when the uh, Pope visited. We were actually on the U.S. side in El Paso, but uh, they had a remote location where they were doing a, a rebroadcast of the speeches and such, and then big street parties and everything. And so we set up down there just to monitor that whole situation, uh, which was a lot of fun. We've been on a lot of the exercises. Uh, as we get dialed into this, one of the important things is to let your emergency response coordinators know that you have this capability and that you want to participate in the exercises. And that way, they get to know who you are, they get to know what you do, and they'll begin to rely on that. So you can uh, ensure that the phone rings, the next big thing happens. Uh, some of our high-profile high responses, uh, and one of the first responses that we went on once we became a statewide group, was the Ebola outbreak in Dallas. Uh, and that was very interesting. Uh, we've had a lot of flooding in this area, like I said, and then uh, the last couple of years, it's been tornado after tornado. So we've done a lot of a lot of tornado work, which is also interesting because I was on the, the NAPSIG uh, committee to develop the tornado response protocols actually before we had any tornadoes. Since I worked on that, we've had three tornadoes. So be careful of the projects you work on. Um, there's some pictures of us in the different uh, different responses setting up, and you can see they pull in a whole lot of really cool equipment, and all we really want is the projector, the laptop, and the plotter, and, and we're up and going. Um, this was a, a web-based map that we did for one of the regional exercises, uh, and it was basically showing the 42 different locations where we had different teams doing parts of the exercise, and we just basically monitored that one on a... Uh, on RTS Online webpage. And then that picture in the lower right is that Louisville EOC in a box. Uh, you know, getting all that stuff out of the trailer is a lot of fun. Shoving it all back in the trailer was very difficult. And, and we learned that uh, the first pieces you put in, you got to push them all the way up in the back, or the last piece, is, last piece you put in doesn't fit. And the last piece was the plotter, and we almost didn't get it in there. Um, here's uh, some other responses. That, that's the uh, State Operations Center in Garland, they have six regional operations centers, that's one of them. And I think the guy in the middle of the picture in the white shirt was one of our guys. And one of those screens had a map up, but it's, it's they kind of washed out, it's hard to tell. Um, some more of the tornado response, like I say, we've gotten really good at that. Uh, and then the next thing that we're working on, well, before that, Drones. I get asked all the time if we're going to work on drones. Well, drones aren't really a GIS thing. We're mapping folks. And we have drone response teams from other agencies that do drone stuff. They don't do map stuff, but those things can integrate. And so on this last tornado set, they uh, they flew the drones through and took all these geotagged images, and those dropped right into ArcMap like, I don't know, slickered nothing. And uh, we put those up on a web page and just impressed everybody to no end. So that's really cool. If you can, if you can do some exercises with the drone people and figure out how all that works, uh, it can be really impressive on site. And then the other thing is is we're beginning to use these uh, collector apps, either the, the collector or the survey one, two, three, and we're doing that to, for damage assessment. So you can basically go out and go house to house and tag each house, get its location, get its address, uh, and its, um, its damage category. And then obviously those just pop up on the map straight away and uh, it saves us a lot of time. So in conclusion, I wanted to let you know, uh, let you guys know what we do really to, to prepare for this um, and how we integrate into the EOC. We try to, to work with all the local and regional and state level agencies. Uh, like I say, we're a statewide group and we can be deployed by TDEM, but we can also be called to come in and support any other GIS team or any other city or any area that doesn't have GIS that so we just come in and bring it in fresh. Um, we're trying to get, I, I, I always think we're going to get away from paper maps. That's never going to happen. Uh, there's just too many times you got to have one. 
but we're trying to get web services done as well. Uh, in fact, at the last tornado, the tornado took out three cell towers. So, uh, you know, web stuff wasn't really working for us. We had to go back to the printed maps. Uh, we're trying to integrate in with, with the newest stuff, the drones, and using mobile device apps and such. Um, and we just, you know, we want to do this statewide and, and do the best job we can do with this uh, emergency mapping. Now, I've taken all of our materials, not the data sets, but all the templates, all of my training materials, the response guide, the collector app instructions, the, um, the templates for the, for the collector app, everything that I've got that's Texas egret, uh, I've put on a Dropbox. And there's my email at the bottom, director at texasegret.org. Anybody that wants to email me and request that, I will send you a link to that. It's several gigs of stuff. Download that. There's also a little guide that tells you what all you're getting. And um, you can use that to start building your own templates, to start setting up your own web map stuff, even the training guides. You know, just take our logo off, put your logo on if you want. Uh, you've got a good training guide, and hopefully that will get you guys going on, uh, on a good response team. And I believe Thanks. that's Thanks, all David. I'm going to have. That's perfect. We had one quick question for you on the side, which was, you know, how is this funded? Are the members of the response team, are they typically volunteers? How do they get support to, to travel and things like that? Maybe some background would be helpful for the attendees to hear. Okay, so how are we funded? Uh, we're funded basically from uh, private donation. And at each of the training, uh, we have our, our response T-shirts, and we sell the response T-shirts, and we make a little money off of that. Our basic expense is uh, maintaining the website and the toll-free number, and then everything on top of that is, is just a bonus. Because we have people all over the state, we really don't have travel expense. Um, in other words, none of us are going to be there overnight. So it, it might be something that, hey, if it happens down in San Antonio, I'm going to call the people in the San Antonio region and let them go over and handle it and drive home. And if it's something happens up here, then, you know, I'm, I may drive over there. We try to do like a six-hour shift and go home. That way we don't incur overnight expenses. Uh, if we do get into the situation where we get put out somewhere and it's going to be multiple days, the uh, Salvation Army, um, they will typically bring canteen trucks to all the big disasters anyway, so there's going to be food. Um, Salvation Army or, or Red Cross, I know one of our members from the Red Cross is on the line today listening. Uh, so Red Cross can show up with a canteen truck, so there's always going to be food. Um, and then Salvation Army will also bring out one of their camper trucks and that gives us lodging. So if we do get into that long-term situation, we have uh, we have some things set up for that. Was that all? Excellent. That was it, David. Thanks for the answer. I appreciate it. All right. Awesome. If everyone's got that email off of there, I'm going to go ahead and do the stop sharing. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, David. So I love what you showed, you know, going small with 14 cities, right? You grew to 42 counties and 200 members. I think, you know, the value that you put in that for training them on typical FEMA courses as well as some customized things is really impactful. And I love the fact that you uh, kind of went back and said, exercise, 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 right? And I think that's a mantra for all of us listening on the phone is making sure that our GIS staff are integrated into exercises. So if you're an operator or first responder on the phone, you know, invite those individuals into the operations center when you're developing exercises, conducting exercises, and vice versa, right? If you're a jazz person, reach out and uh, go have a cup of coffee and, and get invited to the next exercise. Um, and then from there, I really liked, David, how you focused on agreements with partner organizations for deployment, right? Kind of piggybacking, so to speak, on some of those existing capabilities, but then transitioning to build your own capabilities over time. And I think that's a really good lesson learned. Uh, for all of us on the phone. So you can do the same thing locally in your community. It may be training a small staff of people on those courses and exercising together, developing your deployment capabilities with SOPs, um, and then start branching out regionally to your partner organizations and, and so forth as you grow over time. And if you happen to live in Texas, plug in, reach out to David at, at Texas Egrid and get connected there as a volunteer to support that. So David, thanks for the time today. We sure appreciate it. Sure, and let me add one comment on the exercises. Uh, what you can do you is go talk to your EMC and say, you know, on the next exercise, let us just kind of sit up in the corner and do our little thing just like a fly on the wall and see how you guys do it. Uh, in the meantime, set your map up, project a map up on the wall, and you're going to find out very quickly they'll, they're just drawn to the map. All the discussions mm. will take place in front of that map. So you go in with the, yeah. the idea that you're just going to be a fly on the wall, but you'll get pulled into the conversations very quickly. 
Excellent. Thanks again, David. All right. So next up on the, the presenter today, we have Richard Buckright with the state of Florida and Scott Warner with Bay County Emergency Services talking about how they're doing something very similar for the state of Florida, uh, you know, looking at what qualifications are needed for individuals, how do you support packaging multiple individuals together as deployable teams for emergency response. So Richard, the floor is yours. And if you have any questions, let us know. For those of you who are following, do utilize the chat function on the right-hand side inside of WebEx, just chat a question to us. We'll help facilitate those questions out uh, as we go along. So Richard, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me and see my screen okay? Sure can, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm Richard Butcherwright. I'm uh, the Chief Information Officer with the Florida Division of Emergency Management. And as uh, previously identified, Scott Warner, who is with uh, Bay County Emergency Services uh, in the Public Safety GIS group there um, in one of our Florida counties is, is with us and a part of this effort, as well as uh, Jason Ray, who's the, the uh, GIS administrator here with uh, BEM as well. And so we're going to talk about what we're doing in Florida and uh, which we named the Florida Emergency GIS Response Team. Uh, I'll soon get into a little bit of the history on exactly when we decided to steal everything that we saw David doing. Um, but to uh, just want to set a background first before we kind of get there. So we do have, um, you know, GIS response in Florida uh, has been robust and has a long history. Uh, we're very blessed here at the State Emergency Operations uh, Center. We have Jason as the GIS administrator and two full-time GIS technicians. Um, probably some of the better staffing of a state EOC in the nation, perhaps. And, um, you know, we've done a lot with our, our, the, the disaster declarations that we've worked, whether they're just uh, declared in the state as a state of an emergency by the governor or the federal declarations and presidential declarations that come from there. We've, uh, we've used a lot of in-state mutual aid. Um, we have mobile GIS support uh, in that some of the teams in Florida have uh, worked to create a GIS trailer that's in our Region 3 area, and, uh, and that also has a dedicated tow truck to it. And those resources are kind of spearheaded by Duval County with Jacksonville and Alachua County with uh, Gainesville as the major cities. And uh, the Florida Forest Service is, uh, uh, also has some mobile uh, capabilities that can support deployments of small GIS teams. And of course, our mobile command vehicle that the uh, Division of Emergency Management maintains also has, you know, some redundant satellite communications and GIS workstations and a small plotter and such. And so we've, we've rolled some of those teams in support of disasters. Um, in our, uh, under those, those disaster declarations, you know, here at the state EOC, we can very frequently get folks to come work in the EOC. I remember the summer of Deepwater Horizon, I think at our top count there, we had 28 different GIS analysts and technicians from many different state agencies uh, had worked in the state EOC over that summer, as well as some of the counties. We've uh, used more of the in-state mutual aid for some of our disasters. For example, flooding in the Florida Panhandle and Scott from Bay County went over and, you know, worked a couple of days helping another county uh, with their response. And a lot of that's happened, some of that's happened with missions in the state EOC, some of it's happened a little bit more generic or organic with just communication between, uh, you know, county to county. Uh, and there is the full state to state emergency management assistance compact, which some people might be aware of. And we in Florida were the first to use that for GIS specific resources back during Deepwater Horizon. And we've also defined some virtual State to state EMAC teams. Uh, Florida's in and North Carolina's in, and North Carolina's actually even been used during a disaster to support uh, West Virginia. Um, I gave a talk back at the National Geospatial Preparedness Summit last year, uh, and in those proceedings, there, uh, you might be able to find my Developing GIS Staffing Strategies presentation that I gave that goes into a little bit more details on you know, how we do things, particularly uh, at the State Emergency Operations Center, uh, between the, the, the state and federal disaster declarations and the state-to-state -state EMAC. 
But what we really want to talk about today is to go to the next step about the incident management teams that have formed in Florida, and specifically where we're trying to go with an emergency GIS response team here as well. So let me touch quickly on our all hazards incident management team. Uh, I have to give these guys a lot of credit and some, you know, the credit where it's due, that they've done a really good job <clears throat> of establishing a process to uh, form qualified teams uh, across the state, get individuals uh, credentialed, basically. Uh, and we had a couple of different phases with this, and there's a website there where you can learn more about that effort. And the first phase was a historic recognition period where basically they said, let's take uh, all of this time and the folks who have been doing these things in the state for, you know, years, uh, give them historic recognition and go ahead and qualify them uh, for communications leader, uh, facilities unit leader, the other positions that are identified there on the right-hand side of the screen. And after the historic recognition period, uh, where they qualified over 100 individuals across 15 different positions. They also now are looking at a task book phase. And so far we have about 30, uh, more than 30 applicants uh, in this process. And now they're working and documenting their task book and uh, the qualifications and experience that they're getting and they're tracking the training that they're receiving to also uh, you know, be qualified for these positions. Of course, if you were looking at the positions, you noticed there's no GIS positions considered within these all hazards IMTs. Uh, I really got a chuckle out of David talking about the do it yourself mapping teams. And I, uh, but the point is so valid and really needs to be stressed that, you know, yes, you're taking away a search and, wild, uh, and rescue specialist. You're taking away uh, a, a logistic specialist uh, to do mapping. It really shouldn't work that way. The mapping guys and gals should be there too to supplement the teams. Um, I also know, you know, several of these other teams that work nationwide. Uh, for example, my friend uh, Tony Speechy with Missouri, who is with a, a USAR team, a federal search and rescue team. He's, uh, I believe, the uh, finance officer. <laughs> for that team, but when he, uh, you know, goes in the field, he's actually doing GIS. Uh, actually, I think he's the plans guy. It's another uh, team I'm thinking about um, where the, the GIS person is really the finance officer. Um, but when he gets on site, he does GIS more than he does finance, but there is no qualified GIS position on the team, so he, he has to fall in that role. So here in our state, you know, we were kind of tracking the all hazards IMT process and the credentialing and the specifications and the resource typing, which I had also previously uh, worked on some with FEMA. And FEMA's done a lot of work in this area for GIS, but they've done it all very specific to FEMA. So that say you have a position description and it's basically gonna say, yeah, this is a geographic unit leader position inside a joint field office. So if you're not in a joint field office that FEMA frequently sets up after a disaster, it's kind of hard to claim that you're using that. So also along came NAPSIG, and NAPSIG uh, identified this gap there and that, you know, we need to establish minimum criteria and qualifications for GIS personnel and teams. And so they developed this version of position qualification sheets and resource types and packages. So I'm just going to skim through these. Uh, there's a lot more de other detail on the NAPSIG website and, uh, you know, other presentations that have gone into these and, and talked about the, the positions that they define and the team composition that they define. And here's an example of the position qualification. And you'll see that um, there's a real nexus between uh, the, 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 the training that's required um, from efforts like the Texas EGRIT, efforts like the Florida EGRIT, and, um, and the NAPSIG uh, efforts. 
to define some of these position qualifications. So I think that's really great that folks like us are working together and, and pushing this forward um, together. And then we really do have this good, detailed, uh, far-reaching and far-encompassing um, qualifications that NAPSIC has, has put together for us uh, that I think is, you know, directly applicable, well, applicable to everyone, not just kind of within FEMA. Okay, so then let's get to the Florida egret. So what are we trying to do with the Florida egret? Yes, at the National Geospatial Preparedness Summit two years ago, I think it was, uh, I met David. And it was just around lunchtime, and I think we sat down and spoke, or maybe it was just at a break. And I just was blown away. And I think it's very interesting that David and I are kind of coming from different uh, perspectives. Like he was uh, re local <laughs> and kind of pushed and grew something out statewide. And uh, I'm kind of different that I'm at the statewide level and I'm trying to push something down further. Uh, but ultimately, we're really trying to do the same thing. It's just uh, a, a different states, different uh, landscapes. We kind of got to you know, start in different directions. But I think we're both pushing really the exact same thing, um, which is to get uh, more of our responders aware of what GIS can do for them to help them in their response and recovery uh, and, and preparedness and, um, you know, get our, our GIS and mapping specialists more informed about preparedness and response and recovery emergency management programs and from the two, uh, complement each other and pull each other together. So we have created a um, website here uh, for the Florida egret. Um, you'll notice we're completely basing everything we're doing, uh, borrowing from the great work that's been done in Texas and also from the work that's being done by NAPSIG on their GIS standard operating procedures and the uh, typing work they're doing as well. So, you know, definitely don't think we're out there creating all of that. Uh, we're certainly just uh, trying to pick up the great work that's been done and move forward with it. <clears throat> so we're a volunteer-based organization set up to help coordinate the GIS response uh, to local jurisdictions and take an all-hazards approach for based on the Texas ideas and concepts Really just got this going last summer in 2016. Uh, I did go and get funding uh, from the Division of Emergency Management to give us a little bit of travel budget, and that's all that we've spent on this so far. I'll go into some of the details of how we're spending it, but indeed that's why we kind of have this formed in the summer of 2016, because that's really when we, um, you know, done a, a Google group, done our website, uh, and then started having some travel in support of this uh, effort. But the idea is for the state and local GIS to work with other state and local government agencies to help with GIS needs in a response. Uh, we do also want to work with private par partners, private sector partners, as well as perhaps students, but we're not there yet. Uh, our current objectives are establishing a leadership team. Uh, we have seven different regions in Florida I'll show you a map of that in a second. And right now we're trying to establish within each of those regions a leader for this team who can be the go-to person to, uh, you know, help attend events locally, um, outreach, take questions from individuals locally, and really try to help build the support for the team. <clears throat> We've been doing some outreach this uh, uh, last month, a couple of months. I've spoken at the Florida Emergency Management Preparedness Association um, uh, conference, uh, the ESRI Public Sector GIS conference. We had a working uh, session on this team with uh, several folks showing up and helping us hammer through some of the standard operating guides. Uh, we've also recently presented at the Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference. We are developing a standard operating guide. We're following the NAPSIG and Texas SOGs and templates. Here's uh, just a map of the regions, as I mentioned. And, you know, we have Scott Warner throwing in and really helping this effort uh, from that local level down in Bay County, uh, really trying to uh, be, you know, a great leader for us in this. We do have some folks that have been identified as some of our regional coordinators, but you even see we're we don't have even seven positions filled out with that yet. 
in our efforts. Our current challenges are pursuing the standard operating guide, wrapping that up. Like I said, we got a lot done at that, at the working session at that ESRI conference. Uh, developing a response guide, developing a memorandum of understanding as needed. Uh, how are we going to handle reimbursement? We like the idea that David mentioned to where he's got so many folks available on the team that reverse reimbursement becomes less of an issue because there's not a lot of overnight travel um, and, uh, you know, just daytime kind of support. And really that's the type of, uh, you know, team we want to en empower here is a lot of, if, uh, you know, local government to local government support that maybe doesn't uh, require a lot of these detailed discussions of reimbursement uh, because the costs are very minimal. Um, and maybe things, you know, happen that, yes, you came and helped me for this special event, and so now I'm going to send, you know, one of my people over to help you next door in the neighboring uh, county or jurisdiction when you have your special event. Um, but that we're surging resources as needed around these events uh, whether they're uh, declared, you know, a, a known uh, disaster or even just some of these spontaneous or, or special events, and um, and how we would handle private versus students and those reimbursements will have to be something we talk about. Um, again, if we have that construct of a full deployment along with a state team and a mission that we're working through the State Emergency Operations Center, you know, depending upon the type of event, we're going to handle reimbursement at that level and, uh, you know, maybe get it back to the presidential declarations, et cetera. So what I'm really hoping we do with this team is, is kind of get that empowering of that local, you know, support, like I said, that doesn't even require that. All right, we want to develop some on-site training courses and, uh, uh, and exercises. We want to work with that all-hazards IMT process that I mentioned. If, uh, we hope that we can get moving along so far that we can really sort of have that all hazards IMT team has got to look at us and say, wow, why don't we just go ahead and, 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 and into our process incorporate GIS technician, GIS unit leader, um, GIS manager, and define those positions and those qualifications and continue to work with um, getting uh, team members credentialed and qualified to those that larger process. We also want to plan for integration of the Florida EGRIT into training and exercises. Some of our future objectives are uh, using CERT TRAC, which is our state emergency response team learning management system, and uh, enhance the capabilities of that to track our training and identify qualified personnel so that, say, I could build tools in that system that allow our regional coordinators of EGRIT to pull up a list and say, here's all the folks who have um, this training and, and experience already available. And if they're not a member of the team, seek them out, ask them if they could be. Uh, support that all hazards IMT credentialing and build GIS task books if needed. And we're certainly targeting participating in the 2018 Florida statewide hurricane exercise um, as a real test for this team coming up, you know, that'll be May of next year. So that's kind of where we are and where we came from. And uh, I'm certainly open to questions now. Uh, Ryan, do we have any? Actually, one that's maybe broad for, for both you and for David on the side. It's a question of, you know, how many other states have you seen have emergency response GIS teams uh, for, of course, we've covered Texas and Florida. I think the model, you know, the question came up, you know, the state doesn't even have a full-time GIS person in the EOC. And, you know, I like the way you highlighted both of you coming from different directions, right, David, from local and then building to the state. And Richard, on your side, kind of state building it down. So maybe just perspectives on other models you've seen that work well in this, this area, other examples that maybe folks can point to and, and look for examples. Yeah, I can go ahead and comment on that. I know that um, New Hampshire is looking at doing this. Uh, they've gotten all of our materials and they're wanting to start something up. Louisiana is certainly want, wanting to do this. They've gone so far as to actually declare a Louisiana egret team. 
Uh, that one is coming from uh, the person heading that up it actually works for FEMA, but it's not coming through FEMA. It's still going to be a separate organization, just like we're, we're a separate nonprofit. So we're a separate organization. They want to do a separate organization, but they'll have members from the FEMA level down to the local level. Uh, Oklahoma's looking at this. Nebraska's looking at this. I've gotten a lot of emails from all over the country of people wanting to grab all of this information that I've got on that Dropbox. Yeah. Thanks. I think we just had somebody chime in too. Sorry, Rajika. We had a person chime in too in Utah saying they're doing something very similar with 13 members currently and developing an SOG. So there are some others out there. Sorry, Richard. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I work with uh, the National State Geographic Information Council as well, and I'm the state of Florida's representative to that council. And so, if you're not familiar with that council, it's a um, a group of mainly state GIS coordinators or geographic information officers um, for those states that have those designated. And uh, in that group, particularly with their geospatial preparedness group, I've been trying to, you know, get outreach uh, about the Texas egret and, um, and make sure that people are aware of it, um, you know, through that group. So I, I know that several states like Utah there um, are, you know, have, have heard that message through the Geospatial Preparedness Committee at NISGIC and are, are carrying it around in, uh, in other states. But I can't tell you exactly where any of them are. I think the information David had there was much uh, more detailed than mine. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. So I've seen a couple of folks chime in on the, the chat with me. You're kind of private on the side saying they're developing things both at the county level, at state level. So there are definitely some models out there that work. And I think maybe an after action from today's virtual training, we'll work to develop kind of a, a way we can exchange a little bit more of information between the, the broader audience here today. So look for some of that follow-up uh, from today. Uh, let's see, there were a couple other questions. So one was a more of a tactical question on the use of HAZIS. Uh, Kind of looking for David and Richard for both your side and maybe some of the training that you've done. Um, how do you feel about the use of HAZAS for pre-incident modeling as well as assisting in response efforts as well? Have you seen that tool used uh, or any guidance that you've got for, for folks on the phone? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that one. I know at the state level, um, they do a lot of the emergency preparedness. We're not emergency preparedness. We're emergency response. So my phone's not going to ring until something bad has happened. Um, at the state level, they are using some more of that modeling. There, there's a new uh, National Water Center in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that's doing a lot of the flood modeling. So a lot of that's going on, but it doesn't really, uh, I'm not really participating in that. Uh, here in Florida, I mean, we've been using HAZARDS primarily for, earth, uh, for hurricanes, of course. And, um, you know, we, we've kind of, arrived at the point where we at the state EOC are pretty much ready to support any local jurisdiction and running hazards. <laughs> um, we think it's just a real, I mean, it's a powerful tool, a decent tool. It's also just a real bear to keep running. So <clears throat> we frequently uh, will take requests from counties and, and both in the preparedness or, or even mitigation phase where we're kind of doing some of the flood analysis and different um, scenarios, flood scenarios for counties, or during a you know, time of when a hurricane's approaching, we will, um, you know, the hurricane exercise we run has its scenarios, and uh, during the time of an actual hurricane, we'll uh, run and pump out reports from that and take requests from counties as best as we can to give them specific uh, damage estimates. But yeah, that's all, you know, preparedness and mitigation really, and not, and a little bit of response in this that it gives you big raw numbers on, uh, on what may happen. Um, we haven't used hazards in flooding. We have, just haven't been successful enough with that. Um, I remember years ago, I tried to run it for a flooding event, and, uh, but we haven't tried that in recent years. You know, not a, um, not a coastal or a storm surge flood, but from a uh, riverine flood, and, and could, how can we use that in response? We just haven't had a lot of luck there, to be honest. Excellent. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right, so we've got a, a couple minutes left, so let me take over here and do the last little bit here with some resources to kind of help you guys uh, going forward. Uh, 
All right, so we've heard a couple of details about the position qualifications. I think Richard did a great job of talking about what exists today in terms of the position qualification sheets that are out there. Uh, you'll find. Sorry, if somebody's out there mute, Richard and Dave, if you wouldn't mind muting again for just a second, a little bit of an echo. Thank you, guys. Uh, so on the position qualification sheet, if you land on the NABSIC Foundation website, nabsicfoundation.org, you'll see a resources tab at the very top, and that will land you on this page here, and you'll see qualifications and credentialing as a button that will launch you into that page. Uh, at that location, you can download each of the templates for the, the qualifications for the GS technician, analyst, supervisor, and so forth, um, as well as the resource type for our MAP support team that uh, Richard kind of highlighted. And in each one of those, you're gonna find a breakdown, uh, both a type one and type two, a type one being the more advanced function of that position. Um, regardless of that position, right, analyst, technician, and so forth, they cover very standard methodology. So they're gonna talk about description of the duties of that uh, type one or type two uh, staff position. It's gonna talk about the education requirements, training experience, and so forth, all the way down to ordering specifications, meaning it needs to have uh, the process of a laptop and that data go kit that uh, David really highlighted. So what do you need to have that individual deployable uh, and sustainable there in the field, which is really key. So those position qualification sheets are out there for you to, to latch onto and get started. The second thing I think will help in some of the conversation and, and uh, that we've seen questions come in is in the broader scheme of local maturity, meaning within your city and your county, uh, your state agency, how are you doing in terms of deploying GIS across that agency and sustaining it long term? And so at NAPSIC, we have this tool that we call the Capability and Readiness Assessment Tool, a carrot. Uh, it is a online self-assessment that will guide you through the process of a series of questions aligned with this geospatial continuum, meaning it's going to talk more than just do you have this tool in place. It's going to talk about do you have the right governance, do you have the right standard operating procedures, which we heard a lot about today, uh, everything from tornado SOPs to hurricane SOPs, deployment and so forth, do you have those developed or not? Uh, do you have the right staffing? So if there is inadequate staffing there locally, it may just be one person in the agency that supports everything, uh, and they may need some help, and so that's where these uh, response teams can really then to, you know, highlight the need for that kind of a capability, both at the local and statewide level. Uh, it does get into technology. It talks about integration into training and exercises, which both uh, organizations you heard from today, I think, stressed tremendously. You've got to train, you've got to exercise, and our GS staff really need to be integrated into that so that those conversations can occur early on and look for deficiencies uh, in that regard. And then finally, usage. So those six areas, are guided through the carrot, you'll answer some questions. It will tell you, based on what you reply, kind of where you are today, uh, and give you some examples of where you should think about going next in that process to increase your maturity. Uh, what's really neat, I think, about the tool is that it then becomes discipline specific. So if you are an emergency management organization and you select that in terms of the, uh, your input to the tool, once you get past those kind of core capability things on the front side of governance, SOPs, and so forth, it becomes much more specific to your organization. Uh, we have a series of working groups uh, at NABSIG that have been building this out, and what I've got on the screen now is the example from emergency management. There are a series of core capabilities that all emergency management agencies do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you've seen a lot of those in the SOPs that David highlighted earlier. Um, you've heard about some of those challenges from, from Richard and what they're focused on and the, the next steps for them in developing some of those. You know, this capability list here is a place to start and check yourself for maturity in each of these areas, meaning do you have a solution to help in each one of these capabilities? Uh, the carrot tool will ask you that question. You self-assess where you are today, and we break it down in a very simple crawling, walking, and running uh, terminology. So crawl is you're brand new to this uh, capability in terms of using GIS to support that. Walking is kind of the intermediate step, and then running is really fully integrated into other business systems and the like. And we'll give you some very specific examples and resources to get started based on where you are today uh, for you. So I think those two tools in concert, you know, putting those qualification sheets together, coming online here, and then taking this assessment to look for those deficiencies in staffing will highlight some of the need and give you some of that fodder to have that conversation for funding and the like to say that you want to stand this up regionally or locally. Uh, in your, your jurisdiction. So with that, I know we're at the end of our time today. I just wanted to say thanks for joining. Uh, there are a couple of upcoming virtual trainings that you can attend as well. 
uh, July, September, and October on the calendar. You'll find those on the knapsickfoundation.org website as well under the events page. And then a plug for our third annual National Geospatial Preparedness Summit coming up August 7th through 9th at the University of Alabama. Um, important that that's free for all public sector participants, regardless of where you work, federal, state, uh, tribal. And there are travel scholarships that we can provide you to, to help get you there to University of Alabama. It's a two-day event that's going to be hands-on, right? You're going to learn more than just kind of the policy side. You're going to get hands-on into exercise mode, practicing some of these tools, practicing some of this communication technique that you've heard about today that makes these teams successful and really gets GIS integrated into that response uh, that we've heard. So with that, I just want to say thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out afterwards to this. You can find us on the NAPSIC site. There's a contact us page there. Feel free to shoot in any questions you've got, and we'll continue facilitating that with our instructors as well after today. Uh, from that point forward, thanks again. We'd love to see you on the next virtual training, and uh, hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks. Richard, David, thank you guys for, for doing it. Scott, thanks for attending. You're certainly welcome.